Okay, we're live. It's Wednesday night. Thank you for checking out Museum Ship Mafia, where we take you behind the scenes of museum ships across the country and around the world. My name is Ken Stano with the YouTube channel History X. You can search for me and my content on uh, YouTube just by entering History X channel. And tonight, another live broadcast with the USS Slater and the Buffalo Naval Park. Tonight, we're going to be talking about the USS Cod, a uh, World War II Gato class submarine based in Cleveland on Lake Erie. Recently went to Dry Dock in 2021. We've talked about Dry Dock so many different times on this channel and figured it would be now's a good time to bring uh, the story of the cod in front of you guys. All right, like I said, it's a crossover broadcast that involves the USS Slater. I've got John Epp on board. <laughs> All right, all of a sudden you're blurry. What's uh, I have no idea. Do you want me to take you off and you can figure it out, or we could just have Santa? <laughs> oh, there yeah, we go. I was. Oh, there you go. All right, cool. Yeah, all right. So, hey, Santa, how's it going? Not too bad. You've been a good boy. I uh, <laughs> all right, I got nothing for that. Um, <laughs> yeah, I've, I've I've been all right. Uh, let's see. And, uh, like I said, it's a crossover with the Slater, not only the Slater, but we also have the boys from the Buffalo Naval Park. I'm going to bring them on. We've got Steven Tedesco, the, uh, director of education and Shane Stevenson, director of collections at the Buffalo Naval Park. Are you guys settled in now? I think so. Oh yeah. All Very right. Sure. You know, it's kind of interesting in the few minutes before this whole thing starts, I get to watch Shane and Steven mess around with the camera, mess around with the microphone, maybe both. So right up until about 30 seconds before we started, they were stuffing like bubble wrap underneath the camera. Uh, well, there. It's, yeah, it's always entertaining. Also, here's the thing. So, we do, like the, the camera we have doesn't have a clip on it. So it kind of sits there. So for where we're sitting, we kind of have to make it work. Yeah, you were here, Ken, recently, and you saw our uh, inner sanctum, our sanctum sanctum sanctorum, and uh, uh, yeah, you know, we got the camera up here, then down here, and then, yeah, it should just clip on, but uh, we're happy to be here as always, and this is a good view right now, and hello, John, hello, Santa, Chris, Hi, guys. We should, we should yeah, the, uh, the Buffalo Naval Park live from the uh, the break room uh, in the cafeteria at the uh, <laughs> Buffalo <laughs> Naval Park, <laughs> always. Uh, it's yeah it was great to uh, have you you'll see my hat uh you'll be you know i'm happy to uh, say that i love this uh fitted hat now is this hat available anywhere that uh, can for purchase not for purchase i just i just gave it to you uh i gave a bunch of hats to you guys your whole crew uh i mean i want to talk about the visit what you didn't get do you want one yeah oh yeah and i'm like he said he has a beanie for me or skull cap I can send you whatever want whatever you want. I'll get some to John too. Uh, I'll get you one. All right. So here, before I ask John and uh, Shane what the latest is with the uh, Slater and the Buffalo Naval Park, uh, like I was saying tonight, we're going to be talking about the USS Cod, based in Cleveland. It's on Lake Erie, and recently it uh, went to dry dock. It's uh, for me, it was a really fascinating story, and because we're always talking about. Uh, dry dock issues, dry dock questions when it comes to the USS, the Sullivans. I figured this would be a good time to, well, like I said a few moments ago, bring up the subject. So we're going to be talking to Paul, who is the president of the USS. Um, I think I think it's officially known as the USS Cod Submarine Museum. Um, submarine Memorial. I stand corrected. So we're going to have him on at about 20 minutes after the hour. But uh, let's get back to what the status is with the Slater. So what are you guys doing right now, John? <clears throat> yeah, so we've been closed up for a couple of weeks now. And uh, just winter projects. We're repairing some wasted metal in the ward room, as well as uh, a fan area. Um, otherwise... We don't have a lot of major projects going on right now. Uh, oh, after steering. Duh. Yeah. We are um, on the home stretch to finish restoring our after steering. Gary Sheedy has been working hard on that. And 
that's about it, I think. Well, okay, so the thing that I wanted to kind of bring up briefly is that you posted something on, I think it might have been Facebook or YouTube the other day. Um, I always think it's amazing the volunteer turnout that you guys get, even when, you know, it's wintertime now. Uh, yeah. So how do you keep the volunteers coming back? How are you able to do that? Is, is it with food? <laughs> Partially, yes. We do feed them. Typically, we feed them lunch. It is interesting. They show up. We also feed them breakfast sometimes. Uh, then after they eat lunch, most of them leave as well. So uh, we may need to push lunch later into the day to increase our volunteer hours. Uh, we'll see. But <laughs> since day one, uh, even when the Slater was in New York City, uh, the volunteer force has always been tremendous. Uh, we could have anywhere from a single volunteer there, depending on the weather and the day and the project, to uh, a few dozen. Actually, just um, uh, two Saturdays ago, we had about 24 people there. We, we have a partnership with the local reserve center, and they, they help us out, usually on the weekends. And, and that'll continue all through, what, until next spring? Yeah, even during the season, we have all of our volunteers. Uh, we try to push the the restoration and maintenance work during the season onto Mondays and Tuesdays when we're closed. But even during the tours, um, sometimes there'll be work going on. Okay, all right. And it's 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 kind of a question I brought up when I was visiting uh, uh, Shane last week at the Buffalo Naval Park. Uh, you guys seem to have what am I trying to say? The I don't know, the ability to just keep your volunteers coming back for more. Uh, well, I think it's a testament to Tim Rizzuto, our director. Uh, he's been there since day one. Uh, we actually poached him from the kid um, prior to the Slater coming to Albany. And he's been the driving force to keep Slater well-maintained, have a great volunteer force, uh, going to dry dock um, roughly every decade. Uh, he is certainly the uh, the person to to uh, to blame for all the uh, the good fortune we have. If if anyone watching uh, tonight or uh, out there watching this on replay, uh, John Epp, curator, USS Slater in Albany, New York, you can check out their content on the YouTube channel or uh, on YouTube by searching for their channel. Just simply enter USS Slater and it, it comes up. Their channel's been growing. It exceeded 2,000 subscribers not too long ago. You can also check them out at ussslater.org. Moving on to Shane and Stephen at the Buffalo Naval Park. Like I said, Shane uh, is the curator. Stephen is the director of education, the Buffalo New York County Naval and Military Park. You can check out their YouTube channel. Just simply search for the Buffalo Naval Park and also their website, buffalonavalpark.org. Um, so I was there last week. I, uh, I, I had a lot of fun. I will tell you guys. And, and it was, I mean, it was a fun trip for me. I I'd, I'd never been there before. Um, Shane took us all, all around and it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. So, uh, but before we get into that, what's the latest with, uh, the Buffalo Naval Park, what do you guys have going on? Yeah, uh, can we just talk? Can you put that picture up for a second again? Uh, you talking about this one? Yeah, what's with the pose there, Zoolander? The pose. <laughs> Have you seen the video? That's that's me, like trying to. Con yeah. uh, I was so whenever I get nervous, I kind of like chew on, uh, like the like my uh, cheeks, and then it just I don't know. I we were 120 feet in the air. I didn't like it at at all. Um. <laughs> can, I, was... can I ask you two things about that? Um, yeah. Can... All right. I guess. I, all right. One. I guess we're jumping into this. I wanted to put this off, but go ahead. Uh, that's a, I think we should get it out of the way. Um, you, you're a pilot, and you're afraid of heights. I'm a. I am a pilot. That's true. Uh, I am afraid of what I call unsecured heights. Now, mm, okay. what what you can see in this picture here is all right so we were we were it was my idea i came you know we talked about doing a live segment it's like well let's go up let's go someplace where you really haven't been all that much and so this platform 
as you can see here, there is a railing going around here. Okay. So you, you know, you think you're safe, but it's, I could, I could see through the railing. Um, <laughs> it, it was windy. It, I don't know. It was, it was rough. If you want to check out that video, you can find it on the Buffalo Naval park. Just search for ridiculously high and, and it'll come right up. Um, but here's another view where, uh, right towards the top of the screen, that is the, what I, what I call the radar platform mast that we were on. We had to climb up this ridiculous ladder to get there. Um, okay. So yeah, if you want a different pose, that's me hanging on to whatever the hell that thing is. And I don't know, Shane, what did you think about being up that high? Well, I, I, I had the benefit of doing it one time prior uh, once I was on the platform, I was pretty okay. Uh, the the thing is climbing up and down those ladders, it, just the straight vertical. Uh, you know, we uh, you know that's what is a little scary to me is just the straight vertical ladder uh, going up and down. I think like when I'm up high, I don't know if I've been up that high, but right the level right below it. It's not looking down that like freaks me out. It's actually looking up and not knowing like where my footing is or anything. So well, think- and, and you know what? You make a really, really good point because, uh, yeah, looking down is one thing. But when you look up or you look right next to the platform, which is the Sullivan's and the Sullivan's being right next to the Little Rock, looking straight across the platform, you realize you're actually higher than the highest point on the Sullivan's and that, and that really played yeah. with my mind too. Yeah, that did. I and remember. if you like the skyway that uh, you can't see in this picture, but the skyway, um, <laughs> the top of Little Rock goes higher than the skyway. Yeah. To go to the main mast. Yeah. Right. All the way up. That's uh, higher than the skyway, which is a pretty big deal because that was constructed for, um, you know, for the lake freighter traffic. And so the bridge would go over the river like that. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah, John. Uh, Thanks, Hoist. Would uh, <laughs> after going up there the uh, the second time, Shane? Would you go up there a third time? I would. Yeah, would? and at some point, I will probably have to at some point, right, with the crew. Uh, certainly, back in the olden days, that SPS thirty radar would rotate, and then it just burned out, and then the people had passed away who who were working on it. Uh, so. You know, we just have to try to find someone that can get in there and feel comfortable. My wife is convinced that she would have no problem going to the top. She wouldn't be scared. It's nothing. We're all a bunch of babies, although she didn't use the word baby. Interesting. Yeah. Um, <laughs> she's convinced that it wouldn't phase her at all. I I don't think she understands how high up it is. Yeah. And it, the ladders, the vertical ladders to climb up. You know, Ken, they're very narrow. It's almost like, you, you know, and even going up to that particular platform, there's there's like a secondary catch site or, or something. And, you know, you, you your shoulders get a little tight there and you have to kind of wiggle your way through. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the other thing. Yeah, that, that hole that you had to wiggle your way through, um, yeah. you know, really kind of gets in the way of proceeding up the ladder. So that was a challenge. Um you know, everyone's got comments like hoist the jack hoist says, yeah, I'll go up there. Let's go. <laughs> and and like I said, it was all my idea. I thought it was a great idea on, until I was up there. And yeah, no, you did. You did good. And your uncle did great. You know, he was bouncing up and down those ladders like no problem. And, you know, so uh, he if, felt very comfortable. Yeah. And if you guys want to check out the video of us climbing this radar mast, uh, you know, head over to the Buffalo Naval Park. Uh, I think they've got it uh, ridiculously high, or that's the title. So just do a search for that. Of course, it's on History X as well. You can definitely check it out. Um, and one thing I always want to say, it, you know, is a, it was a thrill to be there. I I had a lot of fun. If you ever get the chance to visit the USS Slater or the Buffalo Naval Park, don't pass up that opportunity. There's a lot to see there, but you can also check out their YouTube channels. As I always say, one of the simplest yet most effective ways to support what these guys do is to click subscribe and, and you know, throw support that way. It, it really helps out a lot. So yeah. don't pass up that opportunity to check out the content that they post on their, on their YouTube channels. And also with you, Ken, can't thank you enough and for this partnership that we've developed and your idea for the Museum Ship Mafia. And 
you know, yeah. it's, it's all your coordination. And every time we t see you, we thank you about it. So it's good. Well, yeah. And, and I, I appreciate you having there like, uh, um, and check out their website. You can get stuff like the USS Croker hat, um, which I got here. I absolutely love it. So don't, don't hesitate to support these guys. Um, all right. Enough about my visit to the Buffalo Naval Park as fun as it was. So what's going on at the, uh, the Naval Park right now? What are you guys in the middle of? Yeah, sure. Well, the, uh, for maintenance of the ships and things like that, uh, we finally have Joe Lombardi who is with Ocean Technical Services, OTS, and he is finally beginning uh, about 12, maybe 10 to 12 weeks surveying each of our vessels. Uh, so he has started, uh, his team is actually coming up next week, uh, I think Monday, but he's been here for about, uh, you know, seven business days or so. Uh, and he started to walk through and he's putting together uh, a comprehensive survey of our three vessels and then recommendations moving forward. So that was always the question. You know, we'd started working on that in, say, the late, or, I'm sorry, early fall. You know, we put out an RFP. We chose three different companies and then we each interviewed them. And so OTS was chosen. And uh, a lot of us in the business know Joe Lombardi and it's been a pleasure to get to know him. Uh, so that's from the the three ship side of overarching plans moving forward uh, with that survey. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about, right, it, we just recently put out a video on YouTube about we're getting our admiral's quarters, a total, re or total remake in our admiral's quarters. So uh, we're doing that, and that's coming along well, uh, and we will be developing plans uh, over uh, next summer. Uh, for the Admiral's Quarters, and um, then I'm just trying to work on the collections, uh, you know, kind of doing those winter things, catching up with donations and things like that, so, uh, and that's on my end, Stephen. Yeah, uh, I mean, I'm just been working on a documentary on one of our exhibits um, that we opened in March, the beginning of this year, so we've been filming a documentary, it's about a half hour long, um, we worked with Abby Mecca, who's a local production company here in Buffalo, and it's been quite the adventure. It's taken us all over the East Coast and meeting new people and interviewing people and just learning a lot of information. Um, and we're in the very end of post-production of this um, video, and it will be premiering sometime in mid-January um, on our YouTube page. Um, so definitely look out for that. It's um, I mean, it's been a long time coming. It's been a hard thing to do. It's hard work, and but we're very pleased with it, and uh, we can't wait to like share it with everybody. So, so, uh, uh, so you yeah. think that's that's going to be coming around um, in January, February? Uh, it should be. Um, tentatively speaking, it'll be released January twelfth. Yeah, uh, he's been working really hard on that for a really long time. So it's a uh, it's an exciting thing, and um, yeah. Yeah. And, um, yeah, we're really excited. And like, you know, the company we went with, it's just like a very professional looking video, you know, something you would see on TV or a streaming service. It, it just looks fabulous. So, um, I'm not trying to pat myself on the back too much, too much, but I'm pretty proud of it. And, uh, no, man, pat yourself on the back. Cause I want people to, uh, you know, check it out. So, uh, when you say it's going to be on YouTube, is that going to be on the Buffalo Naval park or is that going to be on another site? Um, to start, it'll be on the Buffalo Naval Park. Um, you know, we're looking at broadcast locally broadcasting it, options like that. Um, but we just we don't want to get too ahead of ourselves, so um, it will be released exclusively at first through the Naval Park. Well, that's pretty exciting. All right. Um, before we move on to the COD, uh, John or Shane or Stephen, do you guys have anything else you want to touch on before we start talking about uh, the USS COD? I just want to know. Um, John, do I ask you now to tell you now what I want for Christmas, or should I wait for the end of the show? <laughs> I am the last person you want to tell. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I just want to I, – also, I'd like to say hi to everyone there. I see Kirk and, you know, Cam, and they've been – you know, I've been saying, hey, Shane, you watching the radar and the forecast <laughs> through the weekend? Yes. Uh, it seems, though, we might be getting – can they survey – oh, thank you. Uh, can they survey these ships in the cold winter? Does that include the hulls? 
Uh, he's doing an internal survey, uh, so it's still pretty cold down there. So we are getting the heaters, the heaters set up. I think that will be this weekend. Uh, we're getting uh, 440 heaters throughout uh, the Sullivans to make it, you know, it's probably 40 degrees down there, maybe even 38 degrees. So, uh, so by the time his team arrives, hopefully we'll have it all wintered up and, uh, you know, that will help with just the main deck. That heat will just come through the main deck and, you know, protect. We don't have any snow now, but, you know, we know that it's coming. And you were mentioning we're going to get some sort of squall tomorrow. Well, they say some ice and sleet tomorrow, some 50-mile-an-hour wind. So oh, here we go. Should be fun. Tomorrow's our holiday party, too. So Oh, yeah. So, you know, our we did a, a video about the water level, and it is just going down and down and down. Hmm. Uh, so today is even worse. I've never walked on to the Sullivans down from our promenade, down the gang, down the brow. All right. So it's sloped downward. Uh, and I just, uh, we have to uh, really build this into our future plans is the river is just not stable anymore the way it once was. And we just cannot be having these weekly fluctuations. Uh, so, you know, I'm going to be kind of sounding the dive alarm or the collision alarm on, uh, and really uh, saying we have to do something to try and stabilize the uh, our portion of the Buffalo River because, you know, again, I've never walked down onto the Sullivans before, and it's been like that for two days. So, and that's yeah, and it, water level. I did notice that when I was there, the water level was down. Yeah. Um, one thing I want to make one, one thing I want to make sure everyone's aware of that's watching and we've got eh, let's see you know 38 42 people watching we can't do this without the subscribers and viewers so we definitely appreciate you guys being on with us please submit your comments and questions if you are watching this on replay after the live don't hesitate to also submit comments and questions we pay attention to those and we'll get to the answers if we can also just because I'm curious also let us know where you're from um, you know I know we've got yeah, Chopper, down yeah Chopper out of Australia. He's there. So that's always cool. Let us know where you're watching us from. That that that's We get a big kick out of that. Um, and uh, let's see. So with that being said, I wanted to talk about the COD. And, you know, uh, you talk about having uh, a hull survey done. And I'm sure that type of thing was done. Uh, back in 2021, the COD was taken from its uh, position in Cleveland and towed across Lake Erie to uh, the Don John shipyards for uh, dry dock. Uh, here, hold on a second. You know, for dry dock um, maintenance and repair in dry dock. And tonight we're lucky enough to have uh, Paul, who is the president of the USS Cod Submarine Memorial on with us. You can check out the USS Cod's website at www.usscod.org. Uh, so, Paul. Hello. Uh, thanks for joining us this evening. Hey, what a what? motley crew. Yeah. <laughs> well, how, okay, let's, let's just get right into it. How long have you been with uh, the USS Cod? Uh, coming up on my 47th year. Wow. What? <laughs> 47 years okay i started out as a tour guide the summer uh that cod was in the first summer cod was in civilian custody and um then became curator and then exo curator and then sadly when my director passed away in 12 2012 i became president uh it was more fun being number two because i could spend all the money and make all the fun decisions and then when the crap hit the fan, I could step aside, but now I don't have that option. So you've been president then of the USS Cod Submarine Memorial for about 10 years. 10 years, correct. How long of a process or how long was the process in order to finally get to the point where you're putting the cod or getting it ready for dry, dry dock? How many years did that take? Well, there's a bunch of answers. Um, one answer is the minute we got the boat, um, the uh, the Navy captains in the reserve center who were the nucleus of the uh, Save the Cod Committee knew that they had to start saving for a dry docking. So, um, 
you know, they, they started saving money uh, from the get-go in 1976. Um, you know, I look at Shane's beautiful office there. I am so uh, envious of that. You know, uh, here I am in the, uh, in the bunker basement uh, of my house, which serves as our office. Uh, but, you know, we, uh, um, we literally, our, our first ticket booth was a, uh, a card table and uh, a couple of lawn chairs. Uh, and it wasn't for uh, until about maybe two years that we got a small uh, wooden booth. And, uh, and then finally, uh, something that wouldn't blow over in a strong wind. Uh, so all the money that uh, uh, wasn't necessary for paying the light bill or whatever uh, went into uh, an endowment for uh, the, the initial dry docking, which, um, you know, cod being in the fresh water, uh, it wasn't critical. It, it became critical in 2019 uh, when we developed a seven millimeter hole in ballast tank 2B. And I realized that was the trigger uh, that was the boat telling us it's time to to get serious about the dry dock. So, um, but, you know, the thing is, um, uh, we were so busy with uh, various projects and things. Uh, we kind of had, uh, we got a Save America's Treasures grant. Um, we found out the grant program that year was being funded only uh, three and a half weeks before the, uh, the grant uh, window closed. So, uh, even though we were preparing for over 40 years, there still was some last minute running around with our pants on fire kind of thing. So, I mean, you know, the answer is two years and 40, 45 years at that point. So the, the, the cod has been, as I understand it, the cod's been on display on the shore of Cleveland since the late seventies, correct? Actually, yeah. uh, it arrived in 59 as a Naval Reserve trainer, but from the very uh, first day, and like its predecessor, USS Gar, if the Navy wasn't using it, it was available for all kinds of public tours. So I know I visited COD as a student uh, with my father's summer school class. He was a teacher in 1966. So she technically was uh, hosting public tours since 59. And before before that, uh, it was used as a submarine trainer on Lake Erie, correct? Yeah, from uh, 59 to 71, it was a Naval Reserve training boat. One week is in it, a month, reservists would work on it. Is it true, I heard an interesting fact not too long ago, is it true that when it was relocated to Lake Erie and it was used as a submarine trainer in the 50s, because, due to a treaty between the U.S. and Canada, you guys had to remove the deck gun? Don't don't please don't use the treaty word. Uh, let me let me put that to to rest. The Rush Bagot Treaty of 1822, I believe. Um, by 1830, nobody remembered what it was. Um, the treaty uh, existed uh, to demilitarize the Great Lakes in the wake of uh, the War of 1812. Uh, the Gar before us had all of her deck guns. Um, it's just an urban legend that we propagated early on because we were told that by people that we trusted. And it turns out, no, that's an urban legend. Um, Cod didn't have... Oh, wait, that's not, it's not true? <laughs> I thought absolutely was not true. In fact, uh, there are some dead bodies in our torpedo tubes of people who <laughs> kept promoting that, that line of BS and they wouldn't take, uh, uh, um, you know, truth... So we had to uh, execute them. No, uh, um, there is no, there, the Canadians don't care whether or not, Cod had no guns when she arrived because the Navy was no longer using deck guns. So if she had been uh, um, kept in Naval service, she would have gotten guppy eyes and they didn't need guns for that. Guns were removed for storage purposes. And, um, and uh, so we got, I got the guns. Uh, and in fact, the only Canadian involvement was I was uh, kind of dating the, uh, a Canadian woman who was the curator of the Bowfin, lovely and very talented, uh, capable woman. Um, and she helped uh, with some of the uh, uh, 
uh, acquisition of 40 millimeters and the five inch wet mount and certainly filled me in on the uh, on the rush bagot treaty i okay i think i've heard shane talk about in the past about what it was like to to trade guns trade weapons between museum ships you guys can't really do that anymore, can you? You never could do that. In fact, that's why we got a wet mount five-inch gun, a very rare gun. They all belong to the Navy for the most part. And the Navy doesn't want, uh, like, say, for instance, Shane and I to back-channel transfer anything. Uh, it's, it's all property of the Navy curator branch. So um, you would say, for instance, if I had something I know Shane needed, uh, I would let the... Um, uh, curator of the Navy know that this is no longer needed by USS Cod, and uh, we would like to uh, return it. And uh, by the way, Shane at the Buffalo Naval Servicemen's Park is looking for this, and and he would like to take it. Now, you know, you give them the uh, the opportunity to decide what to do with their guns. Uh, a similar um, back channel transfer between two. Um, Navy, well, a naval uh, museum and a private museum. Uh, I won't mention who, but uh, they were doing some back channel dealing, and the curator of the Navy was uh, not happy with that and told them, No, you're not going to transfer it to that place. You're going to send it to COD. Um, so, you know, um, you know, it's uh, we, we try to make stuff available, we don't trade. Uh, for instance, we happened to acquire some stuff from the USS Blenny, uh, which was a, uh, a guppy boat. And uh, we found out that um, Croker needed some, some, I think there were the tables, two tables. We had two tables and uh, we made them available. We don't trade. And if we have it and we don't need it, we make it available. I'm not going to ask, um, you know, although that hat that Shane's wearing looks pretty cool. Uh, maybe you can transfer I, that. I can get you one of those. Yeah, right. don't worry about that. Uh, all right, so let, let let's move on to the whole dry dock process. And and what I'm what I'm getting at here is, it was it was really interesting how the cod left the shoreline of Cleveland. Obviously, it was it was towed out, but in order to tow it out, and and it's thanks to uh, this guy right here, Jason, who was filming on the shore at the time, as I understand it, he's a commercial diver that volunteers for the cod. Yes. And, and so he was filming and as the cod was swinging out, it, it, it collided with a coast guard vessel, the Morro Bay. Yeah. Well, it actually did not collide. I learned a new word, you know, as a former reporter, I thought I had a pretty good, uh, uh vocabulary. But uh, the, the Coast Guard uh, deemed that an elision. A collision is you and I bumping into each other because we're moving around in a room. But if you're standing still and I bump into you, that is an elision. Um, hmm. Yeah, we were pull, pulled into Morro Bay. Uh, let me just clarify. I had contacted the Coast Guard duty officer the night before and said, you know, it'd be nice if you could move Morro Bay. We're moving Cod tomorrow. And it might be nice to have as much room as possible. Uh, and he said, good, we'll let the uh, the skipper know. Well, they sent an email. And the skipper of the Morro Bay opened his emails two hours after the incident. Now, everyone was concerned about our stern being stuck in the mud. And Jason, the diver whose picture you showed, uh, had done, uh, he, he did annual surveys. Um, anyway, um, so we had a pretty good idea of the bottom profile back there. And, um, and you know, some people were concerned about it being stuck in the mud and others, uh, like myself, I didn't really think two tugs would uh, have much problem. So we cast off the lines. Uh, the, the two tugs pulled us about 15 feet away from the seawall, uh, at least a bow. And then uh, uh, moved us 30 feet forward. Now, I'm up on the bridge with the marine radio. And uh, I got on the circuit and said uh, to the captain, I said, you know, we're clear uh, back aft. You can go ahead and uh, maneuver as you need. And the, the, the message came back, stay off the line. Let me do my job. So I put a sock in it. And uh, 
they continued to pull us 100 feet forward <clears throat> and then rotated us into Morro Bay. And uh, to my credit, I did not get back on the circuit and say, uh, <clears throat> what was that? So, um, <laughs> you know, uh, moving cod for the first time out of Cleveland in 58 years, we were guaranteed a pound of media coverage. Hitting a Coast Guard cutter, uh, that resulted in five pounds of media coverage. And uh, for Jason's video there, uh, I checked a couple days ago, 1.1 million views. So, uh, yeah. Uh, now, we sustained $13,000 worth of damage. Uh, it was repaired in dry dock. Uh, I just sent uh, a reminder to our towing company that, that bill has not been reimbursed by their insurance company. So hopefully in short order, we'll get a, a check for the 13000 we paid out of pocket. Uh, they took a two-inch nick out of our uh, stem uh, just below the bull nose and a couple other creases. Um, and we moved Morro Bay uh, to the limit of our mooring lines, and we dented her 01 deck edge right there by Cod's bull nose, if you look closely. Uh, there were four five-gallon uh, um, uh, fuel canisters up there, so thankfully we didn't crush anything and cause a spark, or there would have been probably 20 pounds of media coverage, a big fireball on Morro Bay. Now, when, when you talk about bringing a museum ship um, out into the water like that or on the way to dry dock. Obviously everyone's paying attention. So what John and Shane and Steven, were you guys watching at the time uh, or were you aware that the, uh, the cod was going to dry dock? Yeah, uh, we were. Um, uh, I caught a little of the coverage. Uh, we were working with Paul because we were also interested in going to visit while cod was in dry dock. So we were working that angle to meet Paul down in Erie to take a look at the ship, uh, to sit down with Don John and uh, to kind of review what they had gone through the process. And Paul was very gracious and met with a few of us down there and uh, to talk about the, what he has learned, what, what the USS Cod uh, Association had learned about dry docking there. So we were... Uh, did I watch every video? No, but I, I was following along certainly uh, with that. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I remember when you guys went down there. Yeah, yeah, you were on. Well, board. You were, you were on yeah, board. yeah. So let let's get to that. So obviously the cod makes it out into the middle of Lake Erie, gets towed out. There's and Paul then, <laughs> there he is. in the white shirt. You can see him right on the bridge. Yeah, that's me up there on the bridge. Oh, no kidding. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, just, you what? Six six riders going up what now, was that ride, what was that ride like uh what can what do you think what do you yeah. think yeah <laughs> i wish i could have taken all of my crew um it it you know it was the highlight of my life uh since my wife and i haven't had children <laughs> i've been to a couple shuttle launches as a nasa employee so that, that you know we've been waiting for that for 45 years yeah. Was there any concern, any kind of hull integrity concerns? Because you're, you're going, what, 90 miles? Is that right? 105 miles. Uh, you know, we, 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 I can't say we went out in the middle of Lake Erie. Uh, my tow plan uh, basically, and, you know, the tug guys uh, concurred with that. We were never more than two and a half miles offshore. Uh, so we went up the, the shoreline. So Cleveland is is 105 miles from Erie. It was a 14-hour um, tow up because he did a lead tow. Uh, it was only about 10 hours on the way back. We had a cleaner hull, and he did a hip tow so he could go faster. Uh, the way you see it there, the, tow, the tug at our stern was just the assist tug. Once we got out into the lake, he left. Uh, but pulling us... You know, he's both pulling and he has to act as the brake. So he was only going to go so fast uh, because if he had to stop quickly, we're going to be, uh, we'll have a second uh, collision. So, uh, but on the way back, we had a hip toe. I think you got a great shot uh, of the hip toe on the way back. Definitely, we definitely. And, and so getting it 
to Don John, you said it was about a 14 hour run. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and if I remember correctly, you guys uh, tied up along, I think alongside a pier. And then the next day, what you know was put into dry dock. Correct. Uh, so obviously you're seeing the sub out of the water for the first time. I imagine yourself, what was that like? Well, it's, it was amazing. I mean, we had been uh, privy to several other submarine dry dockings, Cobia in uh, 96. Um, we, uh, my director had gone up to see lionfish uh, in, I believe 1999 in Boston uh, and Pam Benito is, of course, uh, they're always in dry dock and they're very, very helpful uh, sharing information. So, but seeing your boat up on the blocks, knowing that you have to write some very scary checks, it's it's a whole different uh, experience. Uh, not unlike perhaps watching your child undergo brain surgery. Oh, okay. Uh, well, <laughs> there what we go. What kind of surprises were you hit with? Well, um, you're looking at it right there. It's an excellent photo. Um, the free flooding uh, area under the uh, um, uh, forward of the uh, of the muzzles, uh, uh, the tube muzzle uh, muzzles of the torpedo tubes. It's very thin plating, transverse and longitudinal stringers, and um, we had opened uh, uh, one and two shutters uh, the summer before and saw quite a bit of corrosion of course the uh the shutters uh and the the structure around um three and four right at the splash zone was really terrible we didn't see that until the shutters came off in the dry dock that was badly wasted and if you look down uh five and six uh was impacted uh with packed in with mud it actually was very good condition the mud keeps oxygen away but uh, once they started cutting in there, uh, that was the real shock to see a lot of uh, ru a rusted, wasted metal. Um, and a similar amount of corrosion on the stern tubes, although this, uh, because we're a Gato, uh, electric boat Gato, uh, they stopped putting shutters on the stern tubes by the time COD was built. So there isn't uh, as quite as much uh, uh, light gauge structure to rust away back there but there still was quite a bit of, um, of corrosion. And I'm proud to say that that was all rebuilt to factory specs to maintain full functionality. Oh, really? So it wasn't, it wasn't just sealed up and made no. to look like it was. No, and cool. that's, I, that's a Hobbs choice that uh, a lot of our sister ships have had to make. I know, um, um, lionfish and, um, um, both in both, uh, they have what I call the uh, Phantom of the Opera masks. You know, uh, there's nothing inside. Um, it would they they've been repaired to maintain structural integrity, uh, and I believe Torsk is the same. Uh, I know uh, Shane, uh, well, your diver. Um, when you guys we invited, of course, we want to share the experience because we were so uh, we we had such a. Uh, a great benefit of, of seeing other people's dry dock. When we went, we wanted to, of course, share that experience with as many people. So I put an open invitation to everybody with a submarine or even a, a, a ship come out and, uh, you know, have a look and, and, you know, we'll share whatever information we can. But um, I know uh, uh, the diver uh, from Buffalo said that, uh, you know, he made the comment, he could swim from port to starboard in that area on Croker uh, because there's no metal there. And, you know, I certainly can understand that, that, that area just is very thin plating. The F so. torpedo and the F forward torpedo. torpedo, a forward torpedo. Yeah. I have not talking about the water levels. I have never seen that because it's been underwater, but with the water level now, I took a walk down there today and you're beginning to see, uh, that area where the shutters would be. Now we don't have one and two. We have three and four right. and six. But even that's becoming exposed for really the first time since I've worked here. Yeah. So, you know we have the BQR four array. Uh, you know right at, that took away torpedo tubes one and two, and uh, so now we're beginning to see three and four uh, with the water level. And um, yeah, same with the app. Uh, you know you can see. 
the whole uh, save uh, the top two torpedo tubes in the aft are just completely out of water now. So, uh, yeah, it's just we were just talking about that today. But, yeah, it's invaluable to actually go to walk under the keel to inspect, to see those things that we know are on the croaker, to see them getting repaired with the cod. Uh, just, you know, it's, it gives you a lot of hope and makes you excited uh, for – and if to go back one, Ken, there you go. You can see, I think, I don't want to speak for you, Paul, but you can see that damage with the, you know, right above. Well, yeah, in fact, uh, that was all new metal. So uh, the upper set and the middle set, all new metal. Um, some new metal down on the very lowest set, but uh, a lot of that was, uh, was still usable. It was blasted Good. and uh, a modern marine coating applied. Uh, other than that, uh, you know, the big corrosion issue is right at the splash zone where the wind and water. Um, and initially, our plan was to give the cod a completely new steel water line, uh, 312 feet on either side, down about three or four feet. And that was budgeted by the shipyard at about half a million dollars. But as it turned out, we couldn't do that in the torpedo rooms because uh, to cut the single hull plating there would would result in the destruction of the torpedo room so we uh, elected to use uh, epoxy there and then we had about 10 percent of the ballast tank uh metal uh cut away uh, and then they hit um the water ball fuel ballast tanks were fine but the water ballast tanks in the 50s were coated uh by the navy with a taffy like uh, a beige taffy coating that turned out to be highly flammable uh, with welding torch heat. And so we had another meeting and they, I said, well, if we're hanging our family jewels on epoxy in the single hull torpedo rooms, I have no problem, uh, you know, utilizing the epoxy over the, uh, uh, the double hull areas. Um, considering the only other alternative was to I uh, have them physically remove all of this coating from the water ballast tanks, and that would have destroyed our budget twice over. So epoxy's rule for cod. You know, I've been asking all the questions, but John, Shane, Stephen, I mean, what questions do you guys have for, for Paul and, and what they went through in 2021? I, I have two questions. Um, I'm looking at a photograph right now of the pitting on the cod. Um, can you explain to our audience exactly what pitting is, how bad it is? Um, and then two, in your dry dock report, you mentioned the services that were actually donated and, and products that was donated to you, uh, specifically paint. Yeah. Um, and now all of our museums, we get donations, artifact donations, but we also receive donations of services from other companies. Um, if you could explain that as well so that, our audience could well, we, understand that a little Cleveland, more. Cleveland is headquarters for Sherwin Williams. My predecessor, Dr. Fakin, uh, his great grandfather mixed the first uh, package of premixed paint for Sherwin Williams back in uh, about 1900. So there's a connection there, and we never mm -hmm. let them uh, forget that uh, that connection. But no, Sherwin Williams uh, stepped up and donated um, the underwater coatings. When, um, when it became apparent that we needed epoxy, uh, Sherwin-Williams makes epoxy. They don't sell it under their brand. Uh, and if you remember that, that terrible cold snap in Texas a few years ago, um, they not only had agreed to donate the epoxy as well as the hull coating paints, but they had to actually go out and buy back from their supply, I mean, from the people they make it for, they had to buy it back and donate it to us. So God bless Sherwin Williams. And uh, that was uh, about $20,000 uh, off the budget. So the paint, uh, the application, uh, P&W painting contractors out of Toledo, uh, they were the favored uh, contractor for the shipyard. That was about $190,000 to apply it, but the uh, coating materials uh, and the epoxy, that was about 20,000. So uh, that was uh, a, a real big help. This is a picture that I just grabbed online 
And so this is a picture, obviously, of the, the cod with that Sean Williams donated material. Cigar, on the yes. Yes, the epoxy. Okay. And the, that's the day before we flooded the dock to come home. Nice. You also there, John, had that question about the pitting. Do you want to cover that? Oh, yeah, about the pitting. So, you know, cod was dry docked by the Navy in 1963. And I got to believe the Navy, first of all, in 63, we didn't have the modern epoxy-based coatings we enjoy today. Um, literally, it probably was the same type of coating she would have used in World War II. Uh, also, I can't, under, can't believe the Navy would have told the, uh, the shipyard in Lorraine, spare no expense, because uh, they understood that this is an old World War II Gato-class boat that probably will be scrapped in about six to eight years. So... I believe the 1963 dry docking was more or less a lick and a promise and a quick coating of whatever they were using on the hull, and it was done. So uh, 58 years later, um, well, that, that coating had long gone, uh, particularly at the water line of the splash zone. It was bare metal. Now, when you've got decades of, of bare metal exposed to uh, wind, water, and bacteriological attack. Uh, we discovered, uh, well, it's been known that there is a bacteria that eats steel and craps sulfuric acid. If that's not a nightmare from a science fiction movie for ship preservation people, I don't know what is. But anyway, uh, so it attacked the basic uh, crystalline structure of the steel. And this is basically uh, uh, mild steel from World War II. So anywhere where there's a little um, molecular flaw in the steel, you get a, a micro pit, and over time it grows bigger and bigger. Um, so just uh, when, we, uh, when we developed that 7-millimeter diameter hole uh, three inches below wa the water line uh, on, the, on the port side, ballast tank 2B, we also noticed thousands of other dime and nickel and quarter sized pits along the water line that were future uh, um, uh, penetrations or perforations. Um, when the metal came out uh, in the areas that we did uh, physically replace, um, there were some areas where 50 or 60 percent of the steel was uh, was missing. Uh, again, all within a few inches above the water line and maybe a foot below the water line. Uh, the deeper you go, the less oxygen and the less pitting. Um, but yeah, it was it we 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 didn't go to dry dock a, a day too soon. When you when uh, you know John asked the good question about the pitting because I, I do I remember correctly in some of the videos it might have been from from Jason the diver that that you guys have the sacrificial anodes that were bolted to the hull. Were, were they were they the wrong material? Well, they were the right material for a submarine being mothballed in a in a in a saltwater environment, zinc. Uh, but in freshwater, magnesium uh, and aluminum are the two metals you want to use. So uh, the zinc was in pretty good shape, uh, simply because it had been sitting in 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 freshwater. Uh, so that all came off, and uh, those little silver. Uh, uh, rectangular uh, um, sinkers you see uh, all over her hull in that beautiful shot of the of the coated uh, the, the painted boat those are the aluminum anodes so aluminum is what protects a museum ship in fresh water that or, or magnesium I know Tim Rizzuto and I had a conversation about uh, magnesium versus aluminum um, you know if money was no object uh, we'd all have magnesium but uh, uh aluminum is uh, less than half the price and um you know i think the biggest protection for any hull is a good modern paint coating uh well maintained so the the restoration the um the dry docking is you know completed and it's time to bring the cod back. Uh, and you said this time you've got the tugboat alongside. It's a much well, he's cleaner on the hull. Stern, stern quarter. Yeah, aft stern quarter, hip toe. Were you on board for this? Uh, yeah. 
And, and um, uh, we, we actually had some uh, stowaways. Hopefully nobody from the Marine Safety Unit is watching this. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I lost the ability to count uh, on the way back. <laughs> So you had well, six. You had six on the way to dry dock, but you had how many on the way back? I I don't know. I I only could count so. Much. I don't know. Good. Fair Ten. enough. Ten. You only had so many fingers. Ten. Got it. And uh, I'm sorry, Shane. Were you going to ask a question? Yeah. I did. What precautions did you guys take during her tow, especially going to dry dock? Did you have emergency <clears throat> pumps? Uh, well, we had we had two Honda uh, uh, gas powered pumps. Uh, one station uh, forward uh, near the uh, forward escape trunk and one uh, in the uh, after torpedo loading uh, bay uh, and because, frankly, that's the only place where water could enter the people tank uh, through right. the torpedo rooms. Now, no way did I ever expect we would need them. I had full confidence in the watertight integrity of that hull. Uh, but just to uh, placate the Coast Guard and the insurance company, uh, we did do our due diligence. We had two very powerful gas-powered pumps on board. Um, we didn't. We we did uh, uh, constant inspections of the bilges running through the boat, uh, but she she was in beautiful shape, uh, dry as a bone, uh, no problems. Well, and what a know. trip! I know you said that earlier, Paul. What a trip! We're talking about that. You know, John has experienced that, I think. Were you at the Slater, John, when their most recent dry dock in 2020? I was, but I had nothing to do with it at the time. Okay. Yeah, that's we are, one of the things. We are starting to think of 2030 already. Uh, we're hoping to go to dry dock in 2030. Yeah. Have to, right. Yeah, that's what we talk about here, you know, drawing straws, you know. So, I mean, I got to film that, so <laughs> I, I – Yes, I'm but that also means you have to work, right? As Paul did, you, we've got to, uh, you know, we got to be checking the holes in the in the spaces, the whole the whole trip. Well, when you have when you have something like the cod in dry dock, uh, you know, I'm not involved in any kind of a museum ship. But what what is the what are the takeaways for somebody like uh, John at the Slater or you Shane and Steven at the Buffalo Naval Park when you, when you saw the cod in dry dock I think Shane you said you were there so what did you learn or what would you what were you able to take back to the Buffalo Naval Park yeah I think for us we were excited for Paul and Evan and the cod uh, and we it made me very hopeful uh, and it, it made me feel good about us getting together now, uh, getting our plan together. Now, that's something that we had not really done here at the, at the Buffalo Naval Park was to have those forward thinking in 20 or 30 years, we're going to need this. Um, I can't account for it. Uh, obviously, there were probably very spirited discussions, but uh, we are now trying to catch up as many people know. Uh, right of yeah, yeah. We we're trying to catch up with our three shows. And I would say between that and um, you know the Texas and and being at uh, Hinza and and all the preservation talk and presentations that we had, um, it really shows like how important that this is. And even with John saying you know we're thinking about twenty thirty already is it's yeah. I mean it's not too early. You're gonna to raise the money. Right. It, it costs right. more than an arm and a leg to do these dry docks, even for. Small but it's never, so it's never like, even like right. all the same. They've been talking about it since you know the seventies. It's never too early to start preparing for your next project um, of preservation on these artifacts. Yeah. Well, you know, I'll say this much: uh, before the dry dock, I was in your shoes in that we had never done this, and and frankly, my predecessor was a NASA a rocket scientist. Uh, he passed away. We you know lost a lot of uh, engineering expertise. But what I took away from uh, Hinza conferences or, or visiting other subs and ships in dry dock, uh, the, some of the intangibles, like uh, just, uh, you know, the realization that, hey, you've got this. You know, this is how we did it. We did it. And if we did it, you can do it. Um, I know uh, Russ Booth uh, and Rich McCallney of the Pampanito, uh, they were helpful. Uh, again, they shared uh, over the years 
uh, their dry dock plans, their reports, their their tow um, um, plans. So uh, we basically uh, cut and pasted. Uh, we learned from them, um, you know, and if you've got uh, the money for guys like Joe Lombardi, uh, particularly if you have a very complex, large ship like Little Rock, you're going to need, uh, you're going to want to have a good survey. And Joe is, uh, is an excellent uh, 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 guy to do that. For us, um, you know, we, we pretty much looked at it as taking our car in for uh, a long overdue uh, 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 maintenance uh, trip to the dealership. Um, you know, uh, valves are valves and steel plate is steel plate, whether it's an ore boat or a submarine. Uh, there's not really very little mystique. Uh, so uh, the shipyard uh, engineering people said, look, we got this. Uh, you know, uh, your plating has got maybe a little more compound curvature than we normally deal with. But it's still plating, and they did beautiful work on the, the compound curves. Uh, and the other thing is valves. I mean, you know, when they get a thousand foot ore boat in, um, they got to make sure it's going to be uh, watertight uh, uh, for the next five years. And for us, we have to be dry and watertight probably for the next 30 years. So, um, you know, we literally approach them and we use their in house staff, their expertise. We knew our sub pretty well, uh, and and basically uh, having looked over the shoulder of our sister ships uh, in the Hinza fleet, um, we were uh, very confident based on the fact that they were able to do it. Uh, you know, just basically having that hand holding, you know, uh, knowing that uh, uh, it's been done and it can be done, and there's no great. This isn't the moon landing, you know. This. This was taking taking uh, you know um, your car in for uh, like I said a long overdue uh, trip to uh, the dealership for repair. What's the now that the cod is back in Cleveland? Obviously, it's winter time, so you guys are are sealed up. But what what's the future for the cod now? Uh, what's the prognosis? Well, there's constant maintenance going on. Uh, you know, we found out that. Um, the, uh, when when ice or debris scraping the hull would, you know, scrape away metal. Today, uh, la over the last winter, uh, it scraped away the black paint to reveal the white epoxy. So uh, we're uh, we're building a small coffer dam so we can uh, get rid of that white scuffing at the water line. Um, we're now involved inside on our last probably big major restoration. Uh, we're putting down uh, historically accurate uh, flooring. Um, the Navy put tile down in the crew spaces, and that's not historically accurate to our uh, target restoration date of 1954, 53, 54. So we're putting uh, um, sheet rubber, which will mimic the linoleum that was down, but last a lot longer. Uh, and that's something we learned from... Uh, uh, Sylvie, uh, Silversides, Kobe, and Pampanito. Did, so did I hear you? Did I hear you mention a coffer dam a few moments ago? Yes, and but my coffer for? dam will fit in my trunk. <laughs> what? But uh, but what is the purpose of of that? You put it against the side of the hull, and you you scoop out the water so that you can access the hull. 10, 12 inches below the normal water line. And when it's dry, you slap black paint on it. And then, you know, when the paint dries, you move it. And, you know, if it's a three foot coffer dam, you move it two and a half feet down and you start doing the next section. Uh, it's being uh, utilized. There's a larger stand in coffer dam they have on the Olympia. Uh, that's basically saving Olympia's life right now. Uh, I'm, massive coffer dam uh, uh, system was used on Alabama and um, and they basically have a, 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 a large coffer dam for uh, North Carolina. But a coffer dam is a box that you put against the side of the hull at the water line. Uh, you try to get as good a seal as you can and you uh, remove the water and now you've got a section, depending on the size of the coffer dam, You've exposed uh, um, the water line and below, depending on how big it is, 
and now you can access that to uh, to apply epoxy or do whatever work you need to do. Is is that something like the Slater has ever messed with, John, or or the Buffalo Naval Park? I mean, have you guys looked at this? No, we uh, so prior to the twenty fourteen dry dock, there was. Um, an idea to install a, a coffer type system in front of the ship to push away the ice when it broke up in the winter, but we never did that. Um, yeah, that's not a coffer. We discovered we don't need it. An ice breaker. Yeah, that's like the closest thing we ever really came to it. But you what guys got your... an armored belt for your ice, which I guess is pretty significant there in, in all the Yeah, Ours... 2014, we put. Uh, uh, piece of steel around around the the wind water line yeah that's, yeah yeah i mean that's like while we were talking about what we're doing with the sullivans i mean a lot of ideas were thrown around so obviously the the idea of a coffer dam was discussed well i think a coffer dam for a boat as big as uh, the sullivans and given the, from what i know about the the, the amount of uh, perforations I think uh, you'd need a dry dock. A coffer dam for us, we, I mean, literally, I'm talking about a coffer dam much bigger, not much bigger than my hands. Right, uh, right. So we can we can get the uh, three, four inch uh, uh, white uh, scuffing where the uh, the the black uh, boot top has scuffed away because of maybe some ice uh, friction. Uh, you know, we just have to get down five, six, seven inches below the water line, so we can have that pristine black. Uh, 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 water line without that kind of bumbly uh, white and black, you know. Yeah. Now, do you guys use bubblers? No, we don't. We don't use bubbler. We have a, a, a debris boom uh, to keep uh, the logs from floating in. Um, we found out that if in a storm the boat rocks back and forth, you know, sideways against maybe if we have a, a considerable layer of ice, maybe three, four inches. That there was some scuffing uh, of the boot top black. Um, other than that, though, uh, you know, we did paint it down to the waterline, um, and it it wasn't present. Now we got we got our scum back, and and zebra mussels are reattaching. And of course, when the water gets really warm, we have our seagrass. But it's it's good to see that nice clear profile without that uh, uh, cheese grater uh, uh, pitting that we saw before the dry docking. Will this coffer dam repair, will it have to be almost a yearly? Because you mentioned it was because of ice, right? Yeah, I mean, wherever we see some, some, some uh, scuffing of the black boot top, you know, mm -hmm. you uh, put it in the water. We have a painting barge, uh, you okay. know, just you know, we're, we're, we're still, we're, we're still engineering it. We've, we built a prototype. Uh, you'll attach it, you know, literally probably scoop or, or, or maybe run a little uh, battery powered water pump, get the water down below and then let it dry up and paint it. Then when the paint sets up, you know, pull it off and, and move it to the next section. Hmm. Um, it's just a tool that you would use. I mean, uh, we have a paint barge and that gets us, uh, anywhere we need on the on the hull water line, um, but just to the water line. Do you, uh, John, Stephen, Shane? Do you guys have any more uh, questions for Paul? Paul, I, I know I said I was only going to keep you on for a half hour, but I appreciate you staying on longer to Problem. to talk about this and answer the questions. It's definitely appreciated. Uh, what other questions do you guys have for Paul? I'm just. Uh... Yeah, just thanks so much for coming on. Um, I, I well, always look, hear we're looking forward to seeing experts. Slater next year at the ANSA conference. <laughs> it's we'll be, be bringing the, up a big fun. contingent of COD people. <laughs> oh, so you guys, you, so you guys will be in Albany then for uh, for September. You're coming yeah. too, uh, Ken. Right? You're gonna. I I definitely am looking forward to going. No doubt about it. Oh, um, good. And we're looking okay. at a large contingent for us, obviously, just being four hours away. For four hours. Um, before I let Paul go, you know, because I've been scanning the questions that people have typed in, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I've, I'm gonna throw this question up here, and I want to see what you guys have to say. Where is the Ling? Well, no. Has anyone got an idea of the Ling's status? Ling is waiting for uh, someone to be uh, 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 
give them the coup de gras. I mean, they're done. I'm sorry to say it, but uh, they're they're going to probably be scrapped in place. Um, there is no credible effort to uh, to do anything. Um, you know, she's just she's a she's the dead elephant in the front yard, um, and it's just rotting, and it's a heartbreak. Uh, but it's something that you know was decades coming. Uh, it's not been a good year. Everybody's aware that Clamagor is now uh, in pieces. Uh, Batfish um, is in dire straits. Uh, I had a conversation with a woman who's given was given the task of uh, moving it, and um, her comment to me was, "Well, if we can't find a way to economically move it, we'll scrap it in place." So, you know. Um, this is a bad year for submarines in that uh, a lot of chickens have come home to roost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they spent all that time raising her after her uh, water incursion. And then just to have it just sitting there and not have a plan for it moving forward is just pretty heartbreaking. Yeah, that she developed a, a three or four inch hole uh, in her after torpedo room where the hull is single hull uh, right below the flare ejector. And that just flooded the entire boat within to within about uh, two feet of the top of the pressure hull inside. That's dramatic. Yeah. Mm. And it sat there for over a year. Well, Paul, I definitely appreciate you giving us the time tonight. It, for me, it was uh, it was it was interesting meeting you. I've never met you before, but I definitely look forward to visiting the cod in the spring. And. Uh, um, and then, yeah, from then on, the Hinsa conference uh, meeting uh, you guys in September. That uh, having all you guys together in September that would be that would be pretty amazing. So, thanks for coming on Museum Ship Mafia tonight. Well, well thank you, it's my pleasure. Thank you, Paul. Yeah. Appreciate it. All right, John. Thank you. All right, all right, I'm gonna shut you down, and then we're gonna we're gonna talk about everything you had to say behind your back. So, uh, thanks again for your for your time, and uh, look forward to connecting with you again in the future. All right, anytime. Thank you. Bye bye. All right. Have a good night. Bye. bye. Paul. So, uh, well, I just wanted to ask him if he's recovered from all those uh, margaritas that he was slamming in Hawaii or whatever. Right? <laughs> you remember, he was pounding all those every night. <laughs> I'm kidding. Well, all right. That was a joke. I'm, he, he wasn't. He wasn't doing that. Right. But it was. You know, life was there. Yeah, I, I know. I know you were. I know you were joking. But in all seriousness, and and me visiting the Buffalo Naval Park just last week. I mean. <laughs> I, I was actually kind of surprised how stressful this can be managing a a museum ship operation. I wanted to hear your opinion. You know, you see things in video. You've obviously you've gone to a lot of places, but that was something that I was interested in. Like when you see the ships in three D live, how did did that change your uh, viewpoint? And I'm not saying I'm not suggesting or implying that viewpoint, but I'm just saying. Uh, you know, just seeing it in a video and us talking on the screen and then you're actually walking around the decks. Uh, what did that do to you, for you or to you? Well, okay, let me let me back up for a second. I mean, so I met you guys for the first time in Chicago. Obviously, we've been doing, um, you know, you, Shane, you and I had done Zoom calls in the past. Of course, then we started Museum Ship Mafia. So then, you know, I get to know Steve and John at the same time. But meeting you guys in Chicago, you know, it's really kind of neat. It's neat to actually see the people. Now, the ships are kind of the same thing. You know, you, you talk about the Sullivans taking on water in April or hearing about the programs that the Slater has, has going on. Uh, you know, I'll be looking forward to, you know, checking out that ship in person but when you see the chips in person it's almost kind of the same thing you 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 look at them as being for lack of a better word you know in some kind of celebrity status and then to see them in person um they're bigger but yet at the same time they're almost smaller um and but I don't know how you guys manage it. And so for you to say yeah you see Paul Hammer and Margaritas in in Pearl Harbor uh, or in, in Hawaii, whether he was or not, if he was, I, I, I'd probably at the end of every day, if I were John Epp walking home from the Slater, 
I'd probably have a couple of old fashions lined up, ready to go. Mm, that's a good drink. <laughs> yeah. So I, I like being there. Uh, I really did. I look forward to going back. You know, we keep talking about doing a dirtiest jobs kind of a thing. And I've got it for you, buddy. I've got it. I was down somewhere today. We're all set. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I will say, and, and not too many people know this. Uh, maybe nobody knows this. Uh, Shane, Shane's office is on the little rock, but, uh, later on in the day, um, we went looking for Steven and Steven's office is actually in the museum building um, behind one of the displays. It's actually kind of a cool place to have an office. How long have you had an office like that? Um, since about a, a little over a year now. Um, so you, you could have people roaming around the museum walking right by your office and they never know you're there. So at least once a day when the museum's open, um, I get people that like kind of jump back or they say they're sorry. And I'm like, yeah, you don't have to say sorry. I mean, you're just, my, my office is right next to it. Yeah. They'll just like walk around the corner of the wall. And still will display. Is, so, yeah. um, <laughs> it's been, uh, an experience when it, uh, when it gets about four o'clock now here in uh, December, the building gets kind of dark and I don't have lighting back there. So mm -hmm. oh, that's always, don't. no. Yeah. So I, a lot of flashlight on my phone use. Oh um, yeah. But you yeah. know what? It's uh I don't know. It's it's been a experience and not always a bad one, I guess. Like you get to interact with the museum people or they might have a question um and they're like, "Oh, now that I see you here, let me ask you a question." And I've had a couple times where I mean, I've had like an hour long conversation with a visitor just talking about the museum or the ships or just history in general. And um, it's allowed me to interact with a lot of uh, a lot of visitors that I normally wouldn't. So it has its its ups and its downs. Um, mm -hmm. But I mean, it is what it is. Well, and, and OK, so we had a nice conversation with Paul, you know, really knowledgeable. He's been doing this for decades um, and I look forward to learning more from him. But he seemed to have, you know, like I said, there's got to be a lot of stress. He seemed kind of laid back, but yet I'm sure there's got to be a lot of stress behind a, a position like this. Or or I met Paul Marzello mm -hmm. um, briefly in Buffalo, uh, had a great conversation with him. I, you know, when you're in charge of one of these ships, that, that's got to wear on you, I would imagine. What do you guys think about that? Uh, yeah, I mean, we watched it, I think. You know, watching it in person in, in April time, yeah. was just... I mean, you could just see it wear on him, and he stuck it out and stuck it through, and kind of led the charge, which we were really lucky for that. Um, you're but, you're talking about when the Sullivans took on water. Yeah, you know, uh, that's a perfect, perfect example. So if you, know, you sure. are if you're a, a a Paul president of the USS Cod, um, or a Paul uh, president director of the Buffalo Naval Park, uh, I mean, how do you think they how do you think they handle it? Yeah, I mean, we can't like see into their minds or anything, but I can at least say for um, when when the Sullivans were sinking, um, you know, Paul was here every morning, last one to leave, and held his composure great and led the charge great, um, and that can could not have been an easy thing to do. I couldn't even imagine being in that place. So, um, yeah, yeah, but but you, you you know you have to think what is that stress? You know how how hard is that to do? Well, and like Paul said a little bit earlier with the cod in dry dock, you know, all of a sudden you're standing next to uh, your kid that's about to have brain surgery right. and and being in Paul's position. Now he's got to write some pretty massive checks. <laughs> I, I I have no idea. I can't fathom what that would yeah, be. Like. I, I think that uh, Paul Cod Paul put it rightly. And I think our Paul, the Buffalo Naval Park Paul, Paul, like we Paul Marzello. Think yeah, Paul Marzello, we each take ownership of the ships in our own way. But when you're the the lead director, president, whatever you want to call it, uh, it takes it to a new level of care. The word, the term caretaker just, you know, is expounded when you're an executive director or you're a president. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's something you take home with you. It's, it's you know, it's you don't, you dream about the ships and I don't mean in any like sort of way, but 
you you know that's what i do you dream about the ships you dream about emergencies you dream about it's not like working in a normal museum building where you just leave the building and then you don't think of the building until you go back the next day these are things that are pervasive in our minds and no doubt when you're in that leadership position it's it's just compounded that much more and i'm sure you know for john and tim i'm sure Tim's been an executive director for a really long time. I'm sure there's got to be a, uh, you know, how he feels about it, you know? Yeah. Um, in talking with him, when the Slater first came up to Albany in 97, 98, he had no idea what, what the heck they were going to do. There was no volunteer program. Um, so I, I can't imagine the stress he had to go through then. I'm glad you mentioned the dream, uh, Shane. Shortly, I, I think it was just before you guys um, refloated the Sullivans. I actually ended up having a nightmare. I woke up in the middle of the night uh, that I was standing on our fantail on Slater, but oh. it was in the position of the Sullivans, and I was on the water. Oh, oh. yeah, I just remember your that. Collection. Yeah, your collections yeah. are all back aft. Oh, yeah. Well, and I was just going to yeah. say that for those of you that aren't aware. Uh, John's office is in the aft part of the Slater where, yeah. as I understand it, all the collections, um, all of the items, all of the archived items, those are stored on the ship. So yeah, you definitely, I could, I could see how a nightmare like that would happen. Mm -hmm. Oh, a hundred percent. We're, uh, the water level is just before, just below, um, where, where, uh, the museum space is, but uh, mm -hmm. a leak back there would certainly... Uh, ruin our day to say the least and our collections how how far into the future can you guys you know john or shane how far in the future can you guys predict it's kind of a weird way to ask the question but you know can you guys predict what you'll be doing you know paul said he's been involved with the cod for i think he said over four decades yeah 47, 47 yeah yeah. So John, I know John, he doesn't own a car. He walks to and from, uh, you know, his home to the Slater. Shane lives, you know, within minutes of the Buffalo Naval Park. Steven, he keeps his distance. He's 45 minutes away. But, you know, so how, how, how far do you guys see or how long do you guys see yourselves having these types of roles with these museum ships? I don't know. I could say in 47 years, I'll probably be dead. So. <laughs> well, I mean, you could qualify that with your age currently. You that know? is true. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, no, he's not as old. Um, um, yeah, listen, just, I mean, John, you you live within walking distance of the Slater. This is your yeah. life. This is what you do every day. Uh, do you see that so, doing the same thing five years, ten years down the road? I do. Um, the Slater, you know, as long as we maintain the ship like we do, um, we don't foresee any major issues. Hopefully, um, we bake it into our yearly budget to uh, to to allocate funds for future dry docking. So um, just keep up on the maintenance. As long as we have those volunteers that come in on a daily basis, um, I think we'll be in a good shape. Uh, what about you guys at the Naval Park? How long do you got? How long? Shane, you did not go to school. You did not study to be any kind of a naval architect you know you went you went to school for library science and yet here you are totally surrounded by these three but how long do you see yourself doing this uh i plan on dying at my desk really on the on the little rock yeah i, I do and you know that's kind of an exciting prospect for me uh but Shane, will you be accessioned in the collection <laughs> well, yeah, you know, I would hope so. I hope someone toe tags we're gonna, me. And, uh, yeah, we're gonna embalms me, we're and then they prop them in yeah. uh, one of the offices. So yeah, and I could be like a mannequin. Um, you know, I, honestly, you know, we talk about this. Stephen and I have talked about this. I'll let him talk about his experiences, but uh, I don't know where I would go if I left the museum ship world. There's nothing, you know, twenty percent as exciting you know i my prior job was at a historical museum right and it was just you're sitting in the room and you're processing collections and then you leave 
right here you're just involved in so many different areas and aspects uh i think honestly if i went somewhere else i would be bored to hell uh, because here you you're you're involved in so many different things you have so many different touches with people associations groups memorial groups uh old salts you know uh, and the collections and you know to just go back to a very standard um archival job where i'm just sitting at a desk processing collections all day i think i'm beyond that point uh and would need more of a challenge than that so i'm extremely happy where i am uh it's a privilege to work here uh you know this has been a rough year for all of us uh but i'll let steven talk about his experiences yeah i mean um this has been like a dream job of mine to work in um, an American history museum. It's something I wanted to do since I was, I don't know, 12 or 13 years old. And it took me a while to get into that. Um, but once I decided that's what I was going to do, there really wasn't like a plan B for me. It was like, this is what I'm doing, no matter how hard it is, how much, whatever. Um, but um, I mean, working in an American history setting, whether it's making documentaries like we just made here, um, or it's working in a museum, um, I, I don't think I could leave that ever. So, um, I mean, it's not just my job, it's like my passion. So I will always work in um, American history in some way or another. Sure, yeah, absolutely. It's absolutely in a short, short history, it is um, fascinating. Um, there's so much to unpack. And I love it. I, lo I love that. Um, I also have a little like uh, hobby history of like antiquity for some reason. I love that time era. So maybe I'll write a book on, uh, yeah, you know, King Hero or something. I don't know. Yeah. Um, no, um, but I, no, I love it. I, I can never see myself. The history of ancient maritime culture. There you go. I can't see myself <laughs> in any other industry besides talking about history and telling history and learning and researching and continue to understand history. So, yeah. well, and, I, and I've, I've said it many times before, you know, I'm an outsider. I, you know, here in Minneapolis, we don't have anything like what you guys have uh, in Albany or there in Buffalo. There are no uh, museum ships. We have museums, you know, and we, we have, have items. We have the peanut gang, man. The, well, the what? The peanuts. Snoopy, I no idea. Snoopy, I don't know Charlie Brown. Oh yeah, okay, all right, yeah. Charles Schultz is from. Yes. Yeah, all right. Uh, that's but but <laughs> nothing in the way of museum ships. So when you talk about, um, you know, and I think Eric had a comment here. You know, I would love to work at a museum ship. Visiting you guys at the Buffalo Naval Park last week, I, I, I you know, I'm I'm going to be putting together a lot of that video footage. And I and although Shane doesn't know that I did this, um. As he was, uh, as we were walking to his office, I was kind of filming behind him. I'm going, this is what, this is this guy's walk to work every day. He's walking down the side of the USS Little Rock on his way to the office. He's walking across the USS <laughs> the Sullivan's to get to the Little Rock. And I would just find that a thrill. But, uh, you know, for you guys, it's just an everyday walk to work. And, uh, I don't yeah, know. I'm kind of like at this point. I like Eric's comment. If if it's if it's the same Eric, you got to forgive me. Obviously, we have a lot of people. Uh, he's volunteered a couple of times. Um, so if it is the Eric that I'm thinking of, uh, watch your words, sir. <laughs> you know, <laughs> please, you know, feel free to contact us. And uh, if it's the same Eric, I mean, because we we've worked mm -hmm. with a couple Erics uh, over the summer, so. Well, I just I just looked at the clock. It's been uh, what ninety minutes. So as always, as usual, we go over time. Um, what did you guys uh, or we, before we get to that? I just want to say one more time. You know, thank you to Paul for for joining us this evening. Paul, the president of the USS Cod Summary Memorial. To learn more about the USS Cod, definitely check out their website www.usscod.org. Um, if you want to catch some cool video of the cod going to and uh, arriving in 
dry dock and being in dry dock, uh, Jason, the commercial diver that I guess volunteers or works at the COD, he's got a YouTube channel called Amigo Diver, M-A-M-I-G-O-D-I-V-E-R. He's got some amazing videos of the COD out of the water. Uh, so definitely check that out as well. Um, so with that being said, I just wanted to throw that information out there. Thanks again uh, to Paul for joining us. Uh, John Epp, curator at the USS Slater. Any last uh, words or anything that you want to promote uh, for the Slater? Uh, give us money. Come on, Sa come on, Santa. What do you got going on? Not like this. He's playing for Christmas. For for Christmas, the Slater wants your money. There we go. All right. <laughs> so uh, if, if you're interested in supporting the USS Slater, check out their website, ussslater.org. Of course, they also put great content on YouTube. Simply search for USS Slater on YouTube and it'll take you right there. Um, I always like watching their videos. It's pretty amazing. And like I said, more recently, I was struck by all the volunteers that show up to to, well, in this particular case, shutter the Slater for the winter months. Um, so it, it's pretty cool content. Check out the USS Slater on YouTube. Uh, let's see. Shane Stevenson, curator, Steven Tedesco, educational director of the Buffalo Naval Park. What do you guys have to promote? Um, you didn't talk about encampments, and I know that's we're in off yeah, season, but are you doing it's like where, where, you're retooling. We're retooling the encampments, which we're actually really looking forward to doing and maybe expanding it a little bit and involving some local um, buffalo bisons and go bisons. Yeah. Um, we're looking to expand it and offer more um, than just a night on the ship, maybe like an entire weekend on the ship and then bring in other organizations mm -hmm. in Buffalo to, to work with us. Um, you know, we do last year, we had a couple of people from, uh, Wisconsin, I think, and Minnesota. And we're like, you know, that's a long drive for one night or, you know, 12 hours. Um, what can we offer them? How, you know, can we go bigger? And so mm -hmm. that's something we're working on. I don't know how and if it's going to work, but, um, that's what I'm working on for encampments. We have, Shane. Uh, oh, sorry, Steven, keep going. Uh, we just uh, we have a, the camping program is kind of like crazy. We have like uh, upwards of like 220 campers any given weekend, so it's kind of nuts to begin with. But, you're, but you're, not, you're not doing encampments now. Uh, our last one was the weekend before Thanksgiving. Um, oh, okay, all right. But we are right. looking to expand on that. I don't know if we would do it in December, but possibly starting as early as february um mm -hmm. i mean it really depends on the heat and the water situation on the little rock um of course ice is always a, is always problematic so um you know there's a lot of moving parts to it but i'd like to explore them all and see what could work and like you said at the beginning of the broadcast you also potentially in january have a video coming out on the youtube channel correct yeah so we do have a um a trailer for it on our YouTube page is called Two Wars. Um, basically, it covers um, President Harry Truman signing an executive order in 1948, um, which integrated the military. So it's basically about how we got there. Um, you know, the story is very like about celebrating accomplishments as opposed to any sort of like condemnation of rules that were out before then. It's really on like how we got to where we were in that time period as a country and you know, the people involved that made it work and made it happen. Um, mm -hmm. So we do have an exhibit that's set up in the museum right now. Um, it's called Two Wars, The Road to Integration. And uh, it's been a great project to work on, but it'll be nice when it's all complete. And Shane, anything that you wanted to mention? Yeah, just really briefly, uh, be working, you know, trying to ramp up uh, our YouTube videos again. You know, it's because with everything going on this summer, I besides videos about the Sullivans, but now getting back to the architecture, I'm working on one that I'll hopefully have done by the end of the week regarding the, the five inch, you know, originally on the little rock, it was 
the five inch mount was a six inch turret and going down the ship, there was the big barbette. And so how that architecture changed when they moved uh, the five inch. So things like uh, that, working on the collections, working on the donations that we got this year. There's a lot of them that I just haven't been able to get to. Uh, and, you know, we've been involved in some exciting conversations about our future plans and what we're doing in five years or 10 years. What is the Naval Park going to look like? And, uh, you know, working with outside groups and organizations uh, and seeing their expertise and their analysis. Uh, yeah. So, and not just, um, you know, it's great to have Joe Lombardi here and he's such a nice guy too. Um, and to have around, he's just kind of like always got great conversation. He must eat chicken wings every day. This space sounds like chicken wings every day. So he came from Texas, so he must be enjoying the buffalo wings. But it's not just that too. We I feel like we bring in the community of Buffalo too to be like, okay, well, oh, yeah. what what do you want? Um, what do you think would make this place better? Especially in like, you know, new building or where Canal Side Canal Side is going to be in ten years or the Outer Harbor or just the the infrastructure of the city or or downtown Buffalo. Um, that's right, Chopper. We, yeah, we yeah. definitely take in the, all of that into account. And we, I mean, we work with so many different places. Um, it's just, we have good connections. I mean, we have a children's museum right across the street, um, that we're constantly working with throughout the year. So there's just nice communication and community here in Buffalo, um, where everybody kind of works with each other to see what's going to work best. So that's nice about the city of Buffalo. Mm -hmm. City of good neighbors. Uh, I see uh, one comment really quickly by Eric. Thank you, Eric. It wasn't the Eric that I was thinking of because it is spelled the same way with a K, not a C. Uh, I am going to be working with the kid and Tim Nesmith down there to make a video, uh, hopefully do it live on our YouTube about uh, their challenges with the water level down in the Mississippi and how that affects the USS kid. So I'm hopeful that we'll get that up, uh, you know, do it live or something next week. Uh, we just haven't been able to coordinate our schedule. So, yeah. Well, to check out additional video content, uh, especially with what Shane was talking about, uh, even at the beginning of the broadcast, he mentioned uh, the restoration of the Admiral's uh, dining room on the Little Rock. Check out the Buffalo Naval Park's YouTube channel. All you got to do is search for Buffalo Naval Park and their content will come right up. Also, check out their website, buffalonavalpark.org. As I always say, one of the simplest yet most effective ways to support the USS Slater, the USS Cod, the Buffalo Naval Park, is, is simply to seek out their content, their YouTube channel, click subscribe. One of the most effective ways to throw your support behind their efforts. Um, anything, you, anything else you guys want to add? We finally got our AdSense to work. Oh, so watch all our videos. All right, everybody go watch all our videos, right? <laughs> yeah, now. we finally got, we can finally monetize. We got our pin. Remember how we were talking about yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, D yeah. Let me get, after, it, after I left, it finally showed up in the mail. Yeah, of course. It, it was a whole process. And that included like me filming our office administrator, filling out Did forms really? because it that? wasn't oh. connecting, like it wasn't saving properly. So, I mean, it, it was like, it was insane, but we, um, yeah, th yeah. We got it. So now everyone, you know, that's been helpful that we can monetize everything, but honestly, as there's a comment there from Eric, happy holidays, uh, John, I expect to see you trying to climb down my chimney, you know, on the 25th or whatever that would be the 24th yeah. or the 25th. I, think. I don't know. Um, you know, Ken, I guess he starts on the 24th. Yeah, I guess, you know, and Ken, happy holiday. Thank you, Eric. Uh, oh boy. We're going to get the bills mafia going here. Ding, ding. Uh, oh, we're starting to get some spam too now. And uh, you went to a game the other day. I did. He said it was all right. I think he had a good time. Go local sports team. Yeah, great. <laughs> all right. Well, okay. So let, let's wrap this up. Uh, USS Slater. Check out. Check them out. USSSlater.org. Search for their YouTube channel uh, simply by click uh, typing in USS Slater. As I said a few moments ago, Buffalo Naval Park on YouTube. BuffaloNavalPark.org. Uh, our apologies to Ryan Szymanski because we had Paul go along, had to bump Ryan from the battleship, New Jersey. We'll look forward to having him in the future, uh, there in the future. And finally for audio versions of museum ship mafia podcast, check out museum ship mafia on your favorite podcast platform. Uh, my name is Ken Stano with the YouTube channel history X. 
Simply search for History X channel on YouTube. You'll come across our stuff. Um, if there isn't anything else, I'll just say, everyone, thanks for tuning in tonight. We had a great crowd. Definitely love uh, all the questions that came in from the viewers and subscribers. And we'll be back in January. Uh, for John and Shane and Stephen, again, my name's Ken Stano. Hope everyone has a good night.